Live from DC FinTech Week in Washington, I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto. And from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York City, I'm Matt Miller. We got a lot going on in uh, the crypto market today, Kaylee. A couple of partnerships driving some coins higher that I'm going to show you in just a moment. But you're down at the Spy Museum for FinTech Week in Washington, D.C. I am. This is the second day of the conversations here at FinTech Week, and a lot of the focus today has been on regulation and crypto, especially. We've heard from the chairs of both the CFTC and the SEC. Gary Gensler was speaking just about uh, um, an hour or so ago, and we have uh, the con conversation that's going to continue on this program. We have some great guests lined up for you throughout this hour. We'll be speaking in just a few minutes with Tim Massad, former CFTC chair, plus Michael Sonnenschein of Grayscale, the CEO there, and Sheila Warren, the Crypto Council for Innovation. Plus, a conversation I had earlier with Dave Ripley, the CEO of Kraken. So, a lot is ahead, Matt. Yeah, very much looking forward to that. Let's look at some of the price action in this market. Uh, Bitcoin right now off about a half percent, but holding steadily over 35,000. So, 35,299, 35,300. I'm going to show you um, the lack of volatility in just a moment that we've seen lately. Ether right now trading unchanged at 1892. And Solana also a uh, little change, just down about a half percent, 4273. We've got a couple of partnerships to talk about. One of them uh, I don't have here. Chainlink and Rollup is driving Chainlink up about 7%. Another one is uh, Polygon with near, near Protocol. Um, and as a result, you see Polygon also up about 7% in this market. Take a look at Bitcoin, um, an historical chart of Bitcoin. It's become uh, much more stable of late. In fact, the volatility has reached a six-year low, as you can see from the bottom half of this chart, the top half, just the price action, um, still holding over 35000 Kaylee? All right, Matt, great chart, but let's turn to our first guest for this hour live here from D.C. Fintech, Fintech Week. Joining me now is Tim Massad, former chair of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. He is here with me in Washington. Of course, you aren't just the former chair of the CFTC. You also were the former assistant secretary for financial stability at the Treasury Department and currently are at the Harvard Kennedy School. Great You're to be here with you, Kaylee. Well, it's great to see you. And of course, we've heard from someone who followed in your footsteps as <laughs> CFTC chair. Yes. Benham, Mr. Benham was here earlier, as was Mr. Gensler, talking about touching on at least regulating crypto specifically. How do you think the regulators are doing? Well, I support what they've done in terms of enforcement actions because there are there are a lot of scams and fraud in this space. Mm. But I don't think it's enough. We don't have the regulatory framework that we need. We don't have a federal regulator of the cash market here. Now, Congress could step in and do something, but that's doubtful that that will happen before the election in my book. I've argued with the former chair of the, of the SEC, Jay Clayton, mm. that the SEC and the CFTC could be more creative. They could get together and come up with some common standards and there's a way that they could basically require the trading platforms that are trading crypto to abide by those. The problem is the trading platforms are saying everything we are trading is a commodity and therefore we're not subject to federal regulation. Uh, Gary Gensler doesn't think that's true. Uh -huh. I think he may be right. No, I don't. No, I don't think it's true either. But an enforcement route only is a takes a long time. There are risks, and it's not getting us where we want to be. Again, I support the enforcement actions, but they're not enough. What I often hear from those on the industry side. I heard it from Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple earlier today, is that it's just regulation by enforcement, that that is what is happening here. You mentioned how Congress really could set some of the, yes. the rules of the road here. There is legislation that is passed out of the Financial Services Committee, a market structure bill that would delineate more clearly between the CFTC and the SEC. Do you think that legislation did so appropriately? Should it pass? I think that legislation is going to have tough sledding. I think there's a lot in there that's complex and not quite sure it works. I think the idea of giving more authority to either the SEC or the CFTC in this space makes sense, but I'm not sure that's going to be the vehicle that does it at the end of the day. Now, that same committee did pass a stablecoin measure. Yes. And I'm more optimistic that maybe Congress could act on stablecoins, although, again, if I had to put odds on it, I'd say probably unlikely before the election. But that's another area of crypto where we, where we don't have an, an adequate regulatory framework. I think we would be better off bringing that stablecoin activity within the regulatory perimeter. It's not clear to me that stablecoins will ultimately prove to be that useful. 
but I think the best way to figure it out is to create a regulatory framework. I've argued our regulators could actually do that under, under existing law. Again, they'd have to be more creative than they've been so far. On your stable coin point, I also wonder how in your mind they may or may not coexist if we ultimately get a real digital dollar and central right. bank digital currencies come more into the fore. Well, you know, the CBDC issue is interesting. Lots and lots of countries are looking at that. In the U.S., it's become a bit politicized, which is unfortunate, uh, you know, in terms of the privacy risks, and those would need to be addressed. Um, because I don't think the use case has been really made, but I think we should be at least looking at it. The point is we've got to improve overall our payment system, both domestically and internationally. There are multiple ways we might do this, um, but I don't think we're moving fast enough to do it. And what concerns me most of all are the efforts of other countries mm to look at ways of basically detaching from the use of the dollar in cross-border payments. The dollar, you know, is the prime currency for international payments. That's very important to the U.S., very helpful to our economy. But there are a lot of efforts going on, led by China and others, to not rely on the dollar so much, not just their own CBDCs, but getting together in shared platforms. That's the kind of thing where we really need to be paying attention and doing more to enhance the dollar uh, generally. Well, you hear that from some of these stablecoin issuers, like yes. Circle, for example, has made the case to me many times before that in order to make sure that the dollar remains the global reserve currency, you need to have dollar-denominated stablecoins. Right. So that's an interesting point. To this question, though, about the U.S. versus the rest of the world, yeah. when it comes to stablecoin regulation or crypto regulation more broadly, do you see any other country doing this well and you think the U.S. should maybe follow in those footprints? I think in the... Steps? Yeah, excellent question. I think in the stablecoin area, yes. I think there are a number of jurisdictions that are moving forward to create frameworks, having recognized that, look, maybe these can be useful in payments, but we've got to regulate both the issuer from a prudential standpoint to make sure there aren't runs on stablecoins the way there can be runs on banks to protect the consumer. And also, we need to focus on the rails, meaning the way these things are transferred. I think the Japan efforts in particular uh, are very interesting. Japan has a number of good features in its legislation. The UK just came out with its proposal. Yes. It's still, you know, got to develop that further. But yes, I am encouraged uh, by those things, and those may push the United States to do more. Well, I guess it becomes a question of timing then when that yes. might happen. If you had one word of advice for either Mr. Benham or Mr. Gensler, you mentioned that they should get creative. Do you have a specific example of what that creativity yes, could look like? Yes, they should get together and come up with standards for these platforms. The point is, whether something falls in the securities or the commodities bucket doesn't really matter to the standards we want to protect investors. We want to protect investors from fraud and manipulation, from conflicts of interest. We want to guard their customer assets. They could, I believe, do that today if they were to get together, come up with those standards, and basically say to the platforms, look, you need to abide by these or we'll take action uh, against you. All right, Mr. Massad, thank you so thank much you, for Kayla. joining us here at DC FinTech Week. Matt, of course, that was Tim Massad, the former chair of the CFTC. All right, Kaylee, while that conversation was happening, we uh, had the results of the 10-year auction, the latest from the Treasury today. We had $40 billion sold of 10-year notes, um, sold at a yield of 4.519%. It's lower than the last auction yield of 4.61%. And as you can see from this chart, um, people continue to buy 10-year treasuries. So that yield continues to drop right now, 4 spot 511%. We also had a bid to cover uh, 245 versus the last auction of 250. Indirect bidders were awarded 69.7% uh, if you want any details of this auction. Um, it happens, obviously, as stocks continue to fall and bonds continue uh, to rally. So we don't have that uh, correlation today that we've seen over the past few sessions. Coming up, we're going to speak to the CEO of Grayscale, Michael sun and shine next and i want to point out to access all the latest data and news on crypto if you've got a terminal in front of you, you can type c-r-y-p go this is bloomberg
once we get these ETFs in place, that will open up the gateway for mainstream retail and mainstream institutional capital to flow. And the halving in April is going to cut the available supply in half and is going to eliminate half of the natural selling. So this next four month period is very pivotal to the asset class. Michael Sunshine there, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Michael Saylor uh, there. Uh, he is the MicroStrategy co-founder speaking to Bloomberg. I was thinking about Sunshine because I'm thinking about Grayscale right now. Take a look at this uh, chart. You can see um, that the discount to NAV continues to narrow. And that is after the uh, SEC victory. That's when we started seeing it really pick up um, because the idea is that they'll be able to eventually, Grayscale will convert this uh, over into an ETF. Kaylee? Yeah, Matt, I've got the other Michael here for you. Michael Sunshine <laughs> is joining me now here from DC Fintech Week. He, of course, is the CEO of Grayscale Investments. Michael, great to see you. You, of course, have been speaking here today, and you've been spoken about today a few times, especially your court victory against the SEC when it came to your attempt to convert GBTC into that spot ETF. Where do you stand now? What happens next? Do you have to refile? What has the SEC told you? Well, it's great to be here, and it's great to be here at DC Fintech Week, and great that crypto is such a hot topic of conversation amongst everybody. Um, it has been an unbelievable year at Grayscale, and we I just first have to say thank you to our investors, our service providers, everybody that's been supporting us throughout the court process. Um, a couple months ago, a decision did come out of the D.C. Circuit um, that did vacate the SEC's denial of the GBTC uplisting to a spot Bitcoin ETF on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, we really respected and continue to respect the court process. There was a period of time after that during which the SEC could have challenged that decision. Right. They, in fact, did not. Um, and so what you've seen now over the last few weeks is our team um, putting in the appropriate filings in front of the uh, SEC, including our S3 filing, um, that now really allows us to continue to have a constructive dialogue with the SEC uh, with all the required documents um, that would support us moving towards that uplisting on NYSE. Have they suggested that this dialogue may soon be coming to a close? <laughs> what, what kind of timeline are we dealing with here? So timelines are, are certainly not something that has been discussed. Um, but what I can tell you is that the SEC is constructively engaging at the moment, um, both with having our S3 in front of the SEC, which has been really a, a really nice advantage for Grayscale in the sense that Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, GBTC, has already been a well-known seasoned issuer for several years now, which gives us the ability to file an S3 as compared to some of the other issuers who have had to file S1s. They don't have a product yet or investors or trading history. Um, and so we are continuing to have that dialogue with the SEC, and we remain optimistic that we will you know, get through any final hurdles that need to be there, and our investors will finally get what they've been waiting for very patiently. <laughs> so the way things are trending, it doesn't seem like Grayscale is going to have to, say, sue the SEC again? Well, I'd never say never, um, but what I can say is that every day we wake up, my team wakes up, we are always trying to do everything we can on behalf of our investors. This is what they want, and this is the primary focus for the team. I know you can't get into too much specific on the timeline, but just in terms of sequencing, do you ha are you concerned that by the time Grayscale will actually be able to convert GBTC into a spot ETF, that there already will have been other spot ETFs approved? Do you think there's a real risk of that happening? Well, I, I think I would actually frame my answer in a different way. I would start out by saying, number one, Grayscale um, as a team is operationally ready today. We've been operationally ready to operate GBTC as an ETF, and we've certainly made that very well known uh, to the SEC. Um, we think it's fantastic that there are other issuers that are also trying to launch products. We've well been and long been prepared for a world in which there are multiple spot Bitcoin products the same way that there are multiple Bitcoin futures products. Um, that being said, um, you know, investors have been patient, so we can't have them waiting too, too long because, of course, GBTC continues to trade every day. Investors are actively, you know, getting involved in Bitcoin further. Coming out of this crypto winter, you are seeing investor propensity to want to continue to allocate towards crypto. Um, and the protections of a, a Bitcoin ETF, we think, would be a really, really important milestone towards that. So it seems like you think there's really room for everyone here, or at least there's room for a lot of you when it comes to spot ETFs. But there can be a competitive aspect when it comes to fees. I know mm -hmm. you're 
you will have to drop below 2%, right? How are you thinking about that? Are you going to wait for other issuers to set a fee first before making up your mind on that? What are you thinking? Well, so I've been on Bloomberg many times talking with a bunch of your colleagues, mm -hmm. in fact, about fees because they do seem to be in focus. Um, we will be reducing fees when GBTC uplists to the New York Stock Exchange. Um, I've committed to that before. I'm happy to commit to that again today. Um, what I do think will be interesting is how investors make the choices they do about the products that they're going to be engaging with for their Bitcoin exposure. Um, we at Grayscale certainly hold ourselves out to be a crypto specialist, a company that has had a near decade, or actually a little bit over a decade now, operational track record of success. Um, we've developed the risk disclosures and the frameworks and operated inside the regulatory confines that we find ourselves in today, working collaboratively with the SEC. And it really paved the way for not only our investors to get access to Bitcoin, but now for even other issues issuers to come to market, making use of those very same disclosures. Um, and we do believe that there will be other products on market, but really having that crypto specialty and being a crypto specialist, I do think is a differentiating factor, not to mention GBTC is the largest Bitcoin fund in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it has nearly a million investors. It trades hundreds of millions of dollars daily. And that liquidity profile and that track record I certainly some, is something that I think investors will be attracted to. So they might be willing to pay a premium to another product, is Perhaps. That essentially what you're Perhaps. saying? Okay, interesting. Um, you've mentioned before, as you say, you've come on Bloomberg many times about everything that a, a, being able to convert to a spot ETF would open up. There's been so much hype and build up already, though. Think prices have certainly run very far, as Matt was just outlining. We've seen that discount uh, closing for mm -hmm. for uh, GBTC at, 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 compared to the underlying assets. Is it all baked in already? I mean, what happens the next day if it finally does happen? You know, I love this question because it's a really important point for me to emphasize to all GBTC holders today or who may become GBTC holders. When GBTC uplists in the New York Stock Exchange, there's nothing that investors are going to need to do. One day, GBTC will be quoted on the OTCQX market. And then on the day that we announce it's uplisting to NYSE, it'll still be in their brokerage account. It'll carry the same GBTC ticker and they'll be able to trade it like they did GBTC the day before. So in that sense, it may be uneventful, um, but what will be fantastic about that is that it will allow GBTC to be within the ETF wrapper, have the ability to have creations and redemptions, that embedded mechanism um, that can happen simultaneously that keeps ETFs trading in line with their underlying assets and would eliminate premiums and discounts of the shares compared to the Bitcoin it holds. Okay, so we're all still waiting for this conversion to happen. That aside, what else should we expect from Grayscale in the coming year? Well, I think it's been a year for us to build. Um, every time we've gone through a crypto winter at Grayscale, this is our third crypto winter, we've used it as a time to really think about what else should we be piloting, what else should we be thinking about. So our team has not only finished building out the operational infrastructure at Grayscale, our own RIA, our own broker-dealer, our own series trust, um, but have also begun to pilot other types of investment vehicles. We want to continue to innovate in terms of the exposure we're giving investors as well as the wrappers we're giving to investors. So I don't want to give too much away yet, um, but we are continuing to innovate and work on some new things. All right. Well, when you have news to share with us, I hope you come back. I will come back. <laughs> Michael Sonnenstein, CEO of Grayscale. Thank you so much for joining us here at DC FinTech Week. Now, coming up, the CEO of Ripple says the firm is ready to continue its legal fight with the SEC, maybe take it to the Supreme Court if it has to. We'll have more on that next. This is Bloomberg. She is at the Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. for FinTech Week. Kaylee, earlier you spoke with the CEO of Ripple, Brad Garlinghouse, who says his firm has spent more than $150 million on legal fees in its fight with the SEC. Garlinghouse says he would love to see the case make it all the way to the Supreme Court after the SEC sued Ripple over its XRP issuance. Um, here, here you can uh, see, he says, we'd love to see the Vegas odds on how that will go. We're in it until the end. And of course, many see um, the most recent ruling as a win for Garlinghouse and Ripple against um, Gary Gensler and the SEC. 
Yeah, not just that case, but the Grayscale case as well, which is something that has been brought up uh, here today. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Ali Vershbrill now, who has been here at the conference with me uh, covering this event for Bloomberg all day. Ali, great to see you. So something else I talked to Brad Garlinghouse about briefly was this idea that there's this big narrative out there in crypto that it's rife with fraud and manipulation. We heard the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, saying those exact same words uh, earlier this afternoon. And yet Sam Bankman fried has been found guilty of fraud. There's a, an attempt to say this is one individual that committed fraud. It's not industry wide, but it feels like there still is kind of some concern around that here. You know, it's it is interesting. And I think a lot of the industry will try to say what Sam was doing was not any different than what we've seen in traditional financial crimes. Right. It had nothing to do with crypto in particular. But I don't know that that necessarily is you know, playing on Capitol Hill. You still see a lot of lawmakers that are talking about the fact that there are so many scams and they point to FTX as an example, but also some other market failures that happened in 2022. And I think you're seeing some acknowledgement uh, at this conference. We've seen some crypto executives say, you know, you can't uh, underestimate the impact that FTX and these other failures have had. And it's really about building trust again. You know, they kind of feel like the industry has sort of blown the trust and so gaining that back. Well, you mentioned Capitol Hill and how right. lawmakers are viewing that. There's also been a lot of conversation about the legislative effort that is underway, but unclear ultimately how it's going to end up if the legislation that's been put forward is actually going to pass. We did hear some discussion today about where some of those things stand. I mean, obviously, we had the House Speaker debacle, which hasn't helped any legislative yes. efforts. Uh, we have other priorities before the end of the year. Government spending, obviously, next week is the next deadline for trying to find an agreement there. So I think, you know, there does seem to be, especially on stablecoin legislation, maybe some bipartisan interest. But the real question is, can they kind of crowd out these other competing priorities to get that done? And then, of course, 2024 presidential race is in full swing. So uh, not much gets done on, on Capitol Hill once that kind of kicks off. So very true. What have you heard over the course of today and even yesterday when this event was going on as well that has surprised you the most? I, you know, I mean, I think we're continuing to hear a lot of similar themes. I don't know that there's been much that's been super, super surprising. Um, it's a lot of regulators calling on Congress to act, despite the dysfunction we're kind of seeing in that space right now. Um, it's a lot of, again, you know, the industry kind of distancing itself from, uh, from FTX and some of these other failures. And then obviously regulators continuing to talk about the concerns that they have and potential for fraud and manipulation. So a lot of the same messages. I feel like we're not <laughs> things are like forward <laughs> progress eventually, right? right? All right, Bloomberg's Allison Bearshroll, thank you so much for joining us. We'll have much more coming up here from DC, including my conversation with Dave Ripley, the CEO of Kraken. He discusses what's next for his exchange and his team's work with regulators. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Kaylee Lines at the DC FinTech Week. She's at the Spy Museum down there. I'm holding down the fort at the mothership. We're looking right now at Bitcoin uh, trading off about a third of 1%, but it's still steadily over uh, $35,000. I showed you a chart earlier of the fact that volatility has uh, fallen drastically to a six-year low Bitcoin at 35385 Ether is unchanged right now at 1895 but there are a couple of partnerships in the market today that I think are interesting and are driving, obviously, price action. Chain Link with roll up right now is driving that uh, price up more than 8% to 1413. Um, and Polygon uh, out with um, uh, Near Protocol, a partnership there, driving their uh, price up 7.5% to almost 80 cents. Kaylee? All right, Matt. Well, obviously, I'm here in Washington where there's been a lot of conversation over the course of today and, frankly, over the course of the last many, many months, maybe even beyond, about regulation specifically. That has been a, a large part what my conversations here have focused on. But I also got the chance to speak with Dave Ripley, the CEO of Kraken, not just about regulation and policy he is pushing for while he is here in Washington, but about the business. And he says he's seeing more activity on his platform in recent weeks as we all await a possible decision on spot Bitcoin ETFs and see if any of those applications will get approved. He also says many of those applicants are already Kraken partners. Here's some of the conversation I had with him earlier.
the past month, um, you know, there's been a lot of activity. Uh, you know, for what it's worth, the Bitcoin price is up. There's a lot of energy. I think around the the new potential approval of the ETF uh, is. Uh, generating some, you know, kind of like headlines and, and interest in the space. And so, again, you know, Bitcoin price is up. There is a decent amount of activity. So we've seen a lot of new clients um, uh, pretty much had our strongest kind of month period the past 30 days that we've seen in uh, well over a year. So if things are looking good, would now be getting closer to a time where Kraken might consider going public? I know this is something Jesse Powell used to talk about a lot. Yeah. Um, with regard to, you know, going public, we obviously can't, you know, go into any, you know, kind of specificity on this particular question, but we're, you know, clearly always evaluating uh, capital markets, you know, private and public and, and the like. Are you having active conversations around it? Uh, you know, again, we can't really go into any more detail on, you know, specificity around, you know, fundraising, you know, whether private or public. Okay, fair enough. So even if it's not through an initial public offering, is fundraising something Kraken's going to need to do in the near term? Yeah, in, like in I said, term? you know, private and public are both, you know, kind of avenues out there for, for Kraken. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, as we look potentially to other things that are in Kraken's future, Bloomberg has reported you're going to be looking uh, in 2024 at actually launching trading of yeah. U.S. listed stocks. What's the aim there? How yeah, are you going to compete with a, a Robin Hood? Yeah, we, of course, caught that that article out there. We're, you know, we, we didn't... Um, you know, this isn't something that we've, you know, announced, uh, you know, broadly foray into that product or, or frankly, several others. We, you know, kind of generally have a lot of different uh, things on, on the roadmap with regard to bringing more education for consumers, uh, moving more deeply into institutions as well, in addition to kind of our core, which is, um, you know, individual professional traders uh, as our, our client base. And so whether that's bringing more different tradable, investable assets, more education, uh, or more innovative offerings in crypto, they're, you know, really all out there as far as interesting things on our roadmap. So how do you think your revenue source composition may look different heading into 2024 and beyond? Yeah, well, it's interesting. So, you know, from a geographic perspective, we really have a set of core markets. So it's Europe, UK, uh, Canada, US, and Australia are our core markets. We have presence. We support the, the fiat domestic currency on the ground, uh, you know, teams in those various different markets. And so for us moving forward, it's frankly a lot more investment in those existing core markets. As far as, um, uh, you know, the various different client segments out there, you know, we really started with like one of the strongest platforms for, uh, you know, individual professional traders, kind of that more advanced group. But more recently, we've, over the past few years, moved more towards kind of, uh, you know, consumer and retail and in the other direction towards uh, serving institutions. We have a, a great new custody offering coming out soon for, for institutions. So it really is going to be, um, you know, kind of focusing on these core geographies and then also expanding, you know, and building more for, you know, a breadth of, of different customer types. What would you say that split is right now between retail and institutional? Uh, yeah. users and customers. Yeah, I, we, we don't disclose like, you know, the specificity on this, but there is a good balance as you, as you might might expect, you know, the institutional are more, uh, you know, volume heavy, whereas, you know, when we look at a numbers, uh, from a number standpoint, number of clients, of course, you know, the individuals and in, in consumer retail is obviously the, the vast majority on, on that. That metric. I want to go back to something you alluded to earlier in terms of what's been happening in pricing. A lot of it is optimism around a Bitcoin ETF, mm -hmm. maybe, possibly, eventually yep. being approved yep. uh, by the SEC here in the U.S. What would that mean for Kraken? What do you think the direct translation would be? Okay, something gets approval or, or many of these filings yep. ultimately get approved. What happens to your business that next day? Yeah. And beyond? Well, you know, I mean, just on like whether this gets approved, first of all, it will get approved. It's just a question of time, okay. uh, right? We, you know, so whether that's in the very near future or some somewhere down the road, we know this because um, c countries across the globe have ETFs and similar ETPs products approved. Even in the U.S., we have an ETF already approved. It happens to be backed by derivatives and futures and on a synthetic basis. This new ETF or these new ETFs that are being proposed out there, backed by actual Bitcoin, are just better for customers. So it, it's pretty obvious that it'll get a, approved at some point in time. The fact that it hasn't is a bit of a mystery so far, given it's actually a better for customers. And that you know, should be one of the, the goals of, of these approvals is to, is to bring value and um, you know, investable options for, for customers. So we think it will be, but what's the impact on Kraken? You know, we are supportive of, of frankly, almost all of the different steps to bring uh, 
Bitcoin and cryptocurrency access to individuals. Our mission is to grow adoption of cryptocurrency. So number one, we are entirely supportive of all of these. We think it grows, the, it fulfills our mission, it grows the overall ecosystem, and those things, you know, whether direct or indirect, are going to have benefits for Kraken. Uh, it just so happens that we, um, uh, one of our, our businesses that we run, CF Benchmarks, is the indice, indice benchmark provider for all of these different products out there. So all the, not all, but most of the ETFs that have applications in, they are customers of Kraken. That was the Kraken CEO, Dave Ripley. And uh, Kaylee, it strikes, strikes me that there's a lot of things on which he can't comment. Um, he won't comment. Uh, he hasn't announced yet. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it, it seems like there's just a lot that he either doesn't know or doesn't want to be transparent about, which I'm not sure if that's a, a great thing um, for investors. Well, Matt, not every business leader wants to break news on Bloomberg TV, unfortunately, no matter how hard you and I might try. But to your point, there were a lot of things that he wasn't being firm about. He did tell me when I asked him about staffing levels, whether or not Kraken was going to have to bulk up or lean out in the in the near term and say the next year what what staffing was going to look like. And he said it's really important that Kraken remains nimble. There's obviously a lot of different variables in terms of the macro uh, economy down to regulatory issues. So he said nimble uh, was the word there. And then when I asked him, Okay, so a year from now, are you bigger or are you smaller? He said in a year, it's hard uh, for him to answer that question. If we're talking over the period, though, of the next several years, he thinks Kraken will be uh, bigger over that longer term, medium, medium term, I'll say. All right. Well, that's, I guess, some solid uh, intel there. So um, interesting stuff that we're getting out of Kraken. I feel like we're getting a lot more out of a lot of other firms, but um, we'll see how that goes forward. When we come back, Kaylee's going to be joined by Sheila Warren. She's the CEO of the Crypto Council for Innovation. She's going to discuss uh, crypto regulation. Obviously, SEC Chair Gary Gensler, of course. Just yesterday, Loop Capital's Jim Reynolds spoke about Gensler's leadership. He has imposed probably the most aggressive tsunami of regulations that we've seen in modern times. There's no doubt about that. Capital market is based on trust. Somebody raising money in the capital markets needs that trust because it will lower the cost of capital. Uh, pe people in economics would say it would lower the risk premium. And investors need to know that it's not rife with fraud and manipulation. Now, unfortunately, again, on crypto, it's rife with fraud and manipulation. It also comes back to what is the darn use case of this stuff? Now, we're merit neutral, but the investors need to understand what's the use case for these 15 to 20,000 tokens each individually. What's the use case? And then the investor gets to decide whether to invest. That was SEC Chair Gary Gensler speaking at DC FinTech's event earlier today, where I am right now. And I am joined here by Sheila Warren. She is the CEO of the Crypto Council for Innovation. She also was speaking on a panel earlier today. Sheila, thank you so much for, for joining us. Obviously, it wasn't just Chair Gensler that was talking about regulating uh, crypto. That really has been a prominent focus of conversation here. And yet I was speaking with my colleague, Ali Vershbril, just a few minutes ago, and she was saying, I feel like we've had all these conversations before. It's kind of the same things that keep coming up. Do you sense we're making real forward progress? Is foreign progress, forward progress being made in this room today? Well, there's different questions there. I think okay. globally we are definitely making progress. We've seen advances made in most countries in the world, either things that have landed in regulation or policy or things that are well on their way and there's a path to resolution, the exception of the United States. We've seen some state activity for sure, and of course it remains the case that this is already a regulated industry at the state level and to some extent at the federal level as well. But yeah, there's a sense of deja vu. Here we are in November, last year this time, there was a big bill about market structure that was up. Yeah. This year, same, same situation 
conversation, it does lead us to ask, are we going to be here next year at the same time with maybe not having resolved these questions? Well, as you say, it is November of 2023. This conference last year was held in October, just a few weeks before FTX collapsed. <laughs> yeah. Is that shadow still hanging over this this room and this industry, knowing that he has now been found guilty of all seven counts of which he was charged, Sam Bankman Fried we're talking about here. And yet what Chairman Gensler was just speaking about there was this idea of trust. How much work still has to be done to rebuild the trust that was lost? Or, or is this done, dusted, put to bed, he's guilty and everybody moves on? You know, I think it's a combination of the two things. I think that looking at this and the fact that he was found guilty on seven counts under, by the way, laws that were on the books well before FTX was even created, that I think is quite telling. And the reality is we didn't need new legislation or policy or rulemaking or law or anything to find him guilty of one of the oldest crimes in the books, you know, fraud, right? And that, so to that extent, I think that is done and dusted. And the idea that fraudsters are going to get caught. This is activity that should not be encouraged, should not be engaged in by anyone, because you will get caught and you will be held accountable and guilty for your crimes. Separately from that, though, I do think there's a feeling in Washington that this was challenging. It was challenging for a variety of reasons, not the least of which was that Sam was a person who showed up in Washington yep. regularly and was a very prominent figure here. I think we've moved mostly past that, to be fair. I think the Washington's caught up now with, you know, there's a new speaker and we're, are we going to fund the government? Are we going to go into shutdown? All of those things are more pressing and critical issues. Uh, but yes, there is a specter, I do think, that remains a shadow, I'd say, but I don't think it's a dominant focus or topic of conversation the way it was, obviously, you know, a year ago and even, I'd say, a few months ago. Well, you mentioned that what, what Sam Bankman-Fried was charged under ultimately crimes he was found guilty of is law that has been in existence for a very long period of time. That's the argument that Chairman Gensler makes about securities law. This has been on the books for almost a century. Just apply it to crypto. And so why why are we still, why does it work in some cases and not others? I yeah. guess is my question. Because I think fraud is a, a particularly human act. And fraud is about, uh, it's about lying. It's about deceit. It's about misrepresentation. It's about, in this case, taking money given to you for one purpose and using it for a different purpose and obscuring that you were doing that. Whether something is or isn't a security is not a question of a human action. It is a question of how do you classify an asset that did not exist 100 years ago by definition. It didn't exist 15 years ago, you know? So how do you make sense of that? And how do you reckon with the fact the economy is becoming more and more digital and we're going to have to wrestle with new technologies? AI is coming for us. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up because I was going to say something else that hadn't really happened yet this time last year when this conference was being held was ChatGPT and That's the right. AI boom that has since taken over all of our thought. How are these two industries going to intersect? How should they be working together? And is there is there danger in that until more firm regulation are in place for both things? Well, it's interesting to me to see how there's this call for action around AI and we have to regulate it with executive order. We had an executive order in digital assets and crypto, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, similarly optimistic and hopeful about the promise of the technology. Nothing necessarily came of that in terms of productive legislation that got through Congress. Is that going to be different with AI? I'd count me a skeptic, honestly, Kaylee, based on just what we're seeing in the ability of this Congress to get anything about technology through in particular. The technologies do intersect. It's important to note that a blockchain can actually be a hedge against some of the concerns raised about AI, whether it's algorithmic bias and exclusion, whether it's a lack of transparency. Those are problems that blockchain's designed to solve. And we heard at this very conference multiple examples yesterday all about how AI and blockchain can connect and how tokens can be a mechanism for ensuring clarity, transparency, security, accuracy, and safety within those systems. Are there barriers, though, that stand in the way of that kind of cooperation between these technologies? I think not unlike big financial institutions who all have quiet blockchain and token projects that they're just waiting to release into the wild once there's some regulation, there's a lot of blockchain AI collaboration happening. Not all of it is very public. Some of it's not ready for prime time for the market. But in some cases, I think folks are waiting to see what will the regulatory landscape look like around these two technologies, and particularly around their intersection. Other than AI, what kind of a new development or new implementation of technology is, is Crypto Council focused on right now? I'm looking a lot, as I have been for many years before I even was in this role, back at the World Economic Forum on the metaverse, on XR technologies. That's still I a do thing? Think, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> I think we've seen a lot of co-opting of the metaverse by private corporations, um, many of whom are the ones that are called to account or under fire a lot of the time around Web2 technologies and data issues. 
I remain committed to the, the proposition and the prospect that the data here, like the data play, the data architecture is the critical innovation here, more than anything else. Financial services is a layer on top of that, but until we figure out what our positions are philosophically, politically, and certainly legally around data and its use, how empowered do we want creators and owners of data to actually be? How empowered do we want corporations that try to exploit that data to be? Until we solve those problems, I think we're kind of stuck in a little bit of a pattern where it's tough to really accelerate anything around XR, whether it's VR or AR, or um, even AI, frankly, and certainly blockchain and crypto. Sheila Warren, the Crypto Council for Innovation CEO, thank you so much for joining me here thanks, at Kaylee. DC FinTech Week. Matt, I'll send it back to you. All right, Kaylee, thanks very much for that. Uh, I just want to quickly check on the 10-year and really the S&P after the auction we had at the top uh, of the hour because increasingly it looks like the market's looking to these auctions um, to decide the health of uh, the economy and uh, the funding mechanism. You can see that the yield continues to come down. Now four spot five zero six nine and um, the paper went out at four spot five one and change. Um, so I guess that means that demand continues after the $40 billion uh, of 10 year notes auctioned at uh, one o'clock. The S&P, by the way, has started to turn higher um, a little bit before the auction. We had uh, the nadir of the uh, S&P drop for the day. Day. So it still is possible that we have a rally for an eighth consecutive uh, day if we get into the green on stocks. Coming up, more from DC FinTech Week. We'll talk with Georgetown University Law Center professor Chris Brummer. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lines, live from DC FinTech Week in Washington with Matt Miller in New York. Well, Matt, earlier today, as we wrap up our coverage here at FinTech Week, I had a chance to chat with the founder of this week, Georgetown professor Chris Brummer, about what made this year's event different from the past. Here's what he told me. Well, one of the things that we really enjoy about the conference is that it's one of the few places where you actually have not just the regulators and industry and professors in the same room, but we have panels where the regulators are literally sitting on the same panels with some of the market participants, which is really good because you get the contest of ideas and perspective, and they they, they are sort of forced to, to listen, both 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 sides. And I think that's a very, very productive thing. And and when people listen, that does, even in a town like Washington, D.C., that does have an, an, an impact. Do you think the the tension between industry side and regulators is easing or getting worse? What is what have you observed? I, I think that incrementally both sides are learning a little bit more, not ne not necessarily or only about each other, but I think that regulators are learning that there are aspects of the industry that are going to be here to stay. And I think that the industry is learning that there are aspects of regulation that are going to be quite helpful even if they want to scale. And I think that that does create, let's say, lines or lanes by which you know certain kinds of conversations can 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 be had. Of course, as you mentioned, crypto is another big theme this year, as I'm sure it has been in years past. AI, though, is new. Yeah. Feels like we're all still trying to get our hands around what exactly that technology is, what it's capable of. <laughs> What do you think the timeline is like in getting it actually regulated? So what I've noticed, particularly over our conversations over the last two days, is that the conversation on AI seems to be a little bit more tentative. And, you know, it's an earlier stage where people don't exactly know what they're talking about in terms of uh, what aspect of the industry they need to regulate. Um, and so you have the executive order and people are just trying to implement it. And so a little bit more of a wait and see posture in Gen AI with an understanding that there are some core big national security and other issues that uh, maybe the outside of the financial regulatory space that are immediately uh, sort of the, the, the tension of the White House. With regard to crypto specifically, yeah. I know you have some initiatives yeah. in the works that are new. What are your, or, yeah. you know, tell us more about that in your future well, plans. Well, 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 you know, um, one of the things that I've worked on for a very long time has to deal with this idea of disclosure. Like literally when the Facebook Libra cryptocurrency was kind of rolled out, you know, I was one of the folks who came along with Gary Gensler and people from R3 to kind of talk about it. 
And before I got into the substance, I was trying to figure out what exactly do investors need to know to make investments. And I'll, I'll be spending a lot of time uh, both with private market participants and even talking to regulators about like how to actually move that, that conversation forward. And as far as DC FinTech Week, what are the future plans? It's gotten so big right now that honestly for the nerdy law school professor, I think it's it's time to try to uh, even decentralize this a bit. <laughs> it's so great having the media and journalists and smart people to come have a conversation about it, but we're, we're on the plans of making a nonprofit out of it and, and then really building it out because right now we have people from all over the world and, and it's, it's something that I think will be really useful for the city and frankly for the global regulatory conversation. And that was Georgetown law professor Chris Brummer telling Kaylee about the event, um, uh, the FinTech Week event that she is anchoring from down at the Spy Museum. That's it for Bloomberg Crypto. We'll be back again next week on Wednesday, again at 1 p.m. New York time. For Kaylee Lines, I'm Matt Miller. This is Bloomberg.